Uh, my recollections of the uh, hit not good, the disengagement, it was one of the biggest tragedies that I have lived through in terms of feeling for other Jews. I was there about two weeks before the hit not good with uh, one on a trip with uh, Dove Hiking, Assemblyman Hiking. We saw the people there, we interacted. The people didn't believe this was going to happen. We didn't believe it was going to happen. Uh, there was a warmth, there was a love for the land, a love for the, for the, for the, for their neighbors, for the people, for being there, a sense of accomplishment. They had their their beautiful uh, hot houses, growing flowers, production. Life was going on as usual. Beautiful Bate Knesiot, beautiful Bate Medrash. People learning, davening, and this was all like we we just couldn't believe that there was this doom ahead, and we didn't want to believe that there was doom ahead, that this could actually happen, that there would be this expulsion. Uh, when it did happen on. Matsoi Tishabov, I, I was shell shocked. We were all shell shocked. But I, I just was picturing those beautiful, wonderful people going through what they have to go through at exactly at the time that the Horban bite took place. This Horban took place in our own time. And it was just, uh, it left me with a hole in my heart that I, I just, I just can't get over. I even have trouble reading about it because it causes me such, such pain uh, in my heart. Do I think we did enough? did enough at that time to prevent the expulsion? The answer is very simple. Tragically, no. We were the Jews of silence, and I couldn't believe it, that we're watching a, another destruction. I said to people, people wonder, how is it that the Jews during the Holocaust just didn't do enough? We didn't do enough, knowing everything that we knew about this uh, pending destruction of a beautiful community and a beautiful lifestyle and a beautiful, important part of Eretz Yisrael. We in America did not do enough. We were silent. We were the Jews of silence, people that who we would expect, people who are religious Zionists, uh, people who are organized, people who have the power to make themselves, their voices be heard fell into a deep sleep. I, I spoke about this once, and at the, right before the expulsion, about how can we let this happen. I spoke, it was in Staten Island at a particular organization, and the, the, you know, there was one representative from this organization who was so upset with me in the middle of my words. He, he and his wife got out, walked out in protest on me, and then sent letters around the community that uh, the, what I, the words that I said were hurtful, harmful, and no one should have anything to do with me. Um, it, 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 I'm sure by now, he won't admit it, but he understands where I was coming from. It was, uh, it, it, this is a lesson that we should learn. I would like to think we've learned something from it. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if this happened all over again. How would we react once again? I really would like to say we've learned a lesson. I'm not, I'm not so confident of that. But certainly at that time, there was so much we could have done in the streets, politically, in all different ways, socially, bang doors, make noise, demand of Congress, just done everything we could to say you can't tear this precious piece of land away from the, from the, uh, from the Israelis and hand it over to terrorists. I'm not a Chacham, I'm not a Navi. But I knew, and I'm sure everybody, anybody could have known, could have forecast, and it was forecast, that we're handing over this country to terrorists, and all you're going to get is not peace but in terror in return. And uh, tragically, we didn't do anything at the time. I, I, maybe we've learned a lesson. I don't see the signs are there. And now the question is, what can we do, should we do, to prevent something like this from happening again? Um, well, we do have to take stock. I know now magazines are being written and articles are being written 10 years following the hit not got this in disengagement. Well, let's pull our resources together and let's begin now to think seriously what happens now when there's talk, and there is talk, in today's papers there's talk still, of removing settlers by the hundreds of thousands in order to gain peace, so-called peace. We are threatened by the uh, but we're threatened by the, by the BDS on a, on a constant threat. At least now there is some uh, reaction to it. Um, and there is some important uh, feedback that we're, we're giving. That's, that's, that's good. That's a good movement. But as far as the whole idea of Shtachim, uh, the return for Shtachim, let's realize that the more that we have returned land and political power to the Arabs, the more the world has hated us in return. It's an amazing phenomenon, but that is the truth. We thought after Gaza, well, after Gaza, after all, we're returning land that we, that we worked on, we toiled, we built, we're returning to the Arabs. Now the world will begin to understand us. 
No, what we got instead was wars and then the world condemning us. How dare you respond and defend yourself? How dare you, resp how dare you def defend yourself? You're killing off children, you're killing off innocents. All we got for it was further blame, further heartache. Go back to the times of Oslo. I remember the, clearly that uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, uh, Rabin, he said, Never again will it be said that we are a nation sitting alone, quoting from, from Bilam. And yet we became much more of a lonely nation ever since. The thinking at that time with Oslo was, we're going to give them area A, area B, they, we're going to make, we'll give them territory, we'll give them power, we'll, we'll give them a police authority. And we're thinking was, good, now the world sees we're serious about peace, now they will begin to embrace us. The reaction was exactly the opposite. And the more we gave in, the more, more the world expected us to give in further. You're not going to the next step, you're not completely abdicating, you're not completely surrendering, then, then, then you're really not serious in peace. I think if Israel would stand resolute, I'm the Prime Minister of Israel today, Netanyahu, who's strong, but he needs a lot more encouragement. And if he would stand resolute, and he would stick by what he said originally, and it's true, and Boogie Elon is saying this, this two-state solution is something that was foisted upon us. One of our big problems is that we let the Arabs control the agenda. They set the agenda and we play catch-up. The Arabs talk about giving back lands. The Arabs talk about usurping, about, a, about usurping territory in the 67 war. They're talking about captured territories. These were not captured territories. They were liberated territories. And this whole concept of land for peace that the Arabs set up, we play catch-up. Oh, yeah, well, maybe let's think about it, the whole business of the two-state solution, yeah, it's a good, let's toy about it, let's think about it. Zaloia, the Arabs had their chance with, with, with two states which were offered them at the Hakamat Hamadina in 1948 when, the, when it was uh, offered to the Arabs, then they rejected it then and went to war. Nothing has changed. It, but the Israelis cannot let the Arabs constantly set the agenda. And then we play catch up, and then reality hits us, and then we have forced to say, well, we are, we're not in favor of a two-state solution. We have to just come out and say, Arabs, when you're serious about peace, when you stop terror, when you stop killing innocent people on the road, like a Danny going on, v'chahula, 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 when you stop shooting three kids in the back of the head, we'll be start talking about peace. Until then, there is nothing to talk about.